I didn't and start it, it wasn't my fault, fault. And, and if this was America, America I would sue. sue. Hey, what's up you guys? It's me, Luke, and welcome back to another video. Or if you're new here, welcome to my channel. If you're new here, I post videos about movies, TV shows, and reality TV. Obviously, I have my Kardashian series where I keep up to date with their new show. I just posted one recently. And then I also have my Vampire Diaries series where I've already done my deep dive and recap of the first two seasons. And for those of you asking, I am currently working on season three. So this is kind of... Oh my God, I'm already losing stuff. Why did I open this? There's Mr. Damon. Oh my God, we can't forget about Mr. Stephlessy. So do not fear, okay? I am going to Melbourne for the Eros tour, so. It's been waiting for you, welcome to Melbourne. <laughs> That's taking up a bit of my time. And then January was my birthday and my sister's birthday and New Year's and then we had Christmas. So it is coming in March. So be aware, be square and be there. So today, however, is the start of a new series. You're probably noticing I'm a little, looking a little gayer than usual. <laughs> it's been a while since I did a full beat. I'm trying to serve like Y2K girly girl pink realness. Last year, I did my movie reactions to the Fifty Shades of Grey films and the 365 Days films because I never watched those before. And prior to that, I did my commentary recap analysis of the Twilight films. So I've wanted to get back into my film bag, but I think that chapter is kind of closed with the fanfic erotica situation. And I'm really trying to enter my Y2K rom-com vibe because those are my favorite kind of movies. So, you know, I'll put up a picture of the type of films I would love to make videos on, but I had to start with my favorite. My favorite film from the 2000s is Wild Child starring Emma Roberts. Oh my God. I watch this film every year. I own it sometimes twice a year. It is such a feel good film. The main plots of this film kind of consist of like the fish out of water story where you take a character from their usual environment, put them in another, self-development, friendship, romance, coming of age. It's really just the perfect 90 minutes for me. The general premise of the film is a rebellious, Malibu princess is shipped off to a strict English boarding school by her father. And Emma Roberts, I have to admit, is one of my favorite actresses. Not because she gives groundbreaking Oscar-worthy performances, just because I have been watching her for so long. She's honestly my favorite Nepo baby. Yeah, if you did not know, she is a Nepo baby. Father is Eric Roberts, famous actor, and Emma Roberts' famous aunt, Julia Roberts. Julia Rob hurts. Prior to Wild Child, the first two films that she was a lead in was Aquamarine in 2006 and then Nancy Drew in 2007. But her filmography beyond that is just really iconic. She's known for playing really bitchy rich characters. So we have Poppy Moore, Poppy Moore in Wild Child 2008. We have Madison Montgomery in AHS American Horror Story Coven 2013, which is a very interesting kind of play on the bitchy character because she's also got a darkness to her. You know, she's a witch. She has trauma. And then we have the bitch of all bitches, the icon of all icons, Chanel Oberlin from Scream Queens 2015 and 2016, which I am gearing up to discuss in Halloween of this year because I love this show. I rewatch it every year, pretty much. I rewatched it last year. Now, when it comes to Wild Child, I just want to kind of go through this film, talk about what happens. We'll go scene by scene, talk about my favorite moments and just have fun. Let's have a little kiki because this movie is just the epitome of an iconic artifact from the Y2K 2000 cinema and the teen rom-com genre in general. Oh, Malibu moment. Who are we? So the movie starts with some blue ass water. Shout out Cody Co. Blue ass water. And we zoom in to a beautiful blonde sleeping peacefully until all of a sudden she wakes up, realizes something and yells, shit. Straight away we're sent to 2000s pop perfection with Rihanna's shut up and drive. <laughs> Poppy goes to her calendar and sees a big explosion mark on the date, the 17th of June. Poppy goes downstairs to talk to her sister, Molly, about their dad's new girlfriend, Rosemary, who's moving in today. And Molly, aka Molster, asks Poppy not to do anything crazy. I know what I'm doing, trust me. Poppy! She cuts the crust of her PB&J and hits the road. So there is actually a extended opening sequence that was cut from the film that I'll discuss at the end of this video because I think it definitely adds a lot of context into the film. Uh, slight correction there. I'm actually just going to insert the clips from the extended scene where they are applicable throughout this video. So have fun. 
Hello, Dr. Zimmerman. Hi, it's Poppy. I'm having like a total freak attack. I need a mindset. So Poppy and her rich Malibu friends go outside to a moving truck and she tells them that they need to start pulling everything out and they can just have whatever they want. So this is the belongings of her new stepmom, Rosemary, and everybody is just grabbing what they want, throwing shit in the air. And Poppy grabs a bunch of clothes that she thinks is so last season, tells her girls to watch this, runs in her six inch stiletto heels off the edge of a cliff. I mean, it's not that bad. Their house is like a Malibu mansion with an infinity pool that drops down to the ocean. So she drops into the ocean. All the girls scurry to the edge and are worried if she's gonna survive. Oh my God, there's sharks in there, guys. Oh my God, she's taking so long. She's not coming up. But then all of a sudden she does and she says, welcome to Malibu, biatch. But then the fun is over when Poppy's dad has arrived and yells at her to come up right away. That is the final straw, Poppy. And he's sending her to England. And she calls his bluff saying, oh, what, the boarding school threat again? Which I relate to, because I was threatened to be sent to boarding school a lot growing up. But he's being for reals for reals right now. He says he doesn't even recognize her anymore. And she's all, oh, whatever, you can just replace me with a newer trashier model like you did with mom. You think just because mom went to boarding school in England, it's gonna magically straighten me out? And then as he's walking away, she does the classic holding her arm and shrugging, being like, do you even remember mom? So clearly we have our protagonist who is acting out because of her mother who passed away and her father trying to move on. I pushed him too far this time. Well, at least they speak American there, right? So the next day, Poppy is doing some Googling while her friend Ruby is going through her shoes, being like, oh my God, these Jimmy Choo's will not do well in the rain. And Poppy's like, keep them. And she's like, thanks, loves ya. She's definitely one of those like classic stereotypical fake LA friends who's just using her. Everything's gonna suck without you. Ruby, you're my best friend. I'm gonna miss you so much. And as Poppy's doing her research, she realizes that it says that England rains 200 days out of the year. And Ruby says she's definitely gonna get SAD. It's Seasonal disaffective disorder. disorder due to the lack of sun exposure, which basically causes weight gain and acne, which are two of the worst things you could tell a teen girl in the 2000s. I saw it on Dr. 90210. <laughs> and as they get on the website for Abbey Mount, they both freak as they read that Abbey Mount is an all girls boarding school, which was founded in 1797. And she pleads, hoping it's not in the countryside. But we get a crossfade to, you guessed it, the countryside of England, which is where Abbey Mount is. So that is the opening sequence of Poppy's Ordinary World over in Malibu. It's very quick in the final film, only two minutes, but the original opening sequence was about 10. But anyway, let's go to Abbey Mount and meet all of our characters for the rest of the film. So they arrive at the school, which is huge and ancient, but like in a cool architectural digest kind of way. We see a bunch of teen girls in their blue uniforms, the principal, Mrs. Kingsley, played by the iconic Natasha Richardson, who played the mother from The Parent Trap. Mrs. Kingsley goes to the car and Poppy rolls down the window while filing her nails and she starts yapping, but Mrs. Kingsley interrupts her saying, <laughs> Uh, Lesson number one, Poppy. Negotiations to me are like a nightclub, something I tend not to enter into. Now come along. So Mrs. Kingsley opens the car door, Puppy gets out, and all of the girls are eyeing her up because, you know, she's this LA, California girl, adorned in designer and bold patterns and colors of the Y2K era, where they're all in their gray and blue uniforms, big juxtaposition. And then Mrs. Kingsley brings over Kate, who's going to be Puppy's big sister at Abbey Mount to kind of guide her along the way of the school. And as Mrs. Kingsley leaves, Puppy tells Kate that she chooses her friends. An FYI. You don't make the cut. Then we get one of my favorite scenes with one of my favorite characters from this film, Harriet, head girl. So Harriet shows up to Mrs. Kingsley with her two minions behind her. She grabs two dead turkeys from them and flings them in Mrs. Kingsley's face, saying she caught them herself for her and Freddie. Oh, I don't doubt that you did. But she says she better welcome the girls first so she can hang on to them. She leaves and Harriet flings the dead turkeys over her shoulder and her and her minions walk over to Poppy to introduce herself. Salve. Who, Ella Novella? She pulls out her hand and says, Harriet, head girl. Puppy doesn't shake her hand, just stares at her up and down, and we get one of the most iconic lines. I'm gonna say that quite often, but I love this line. You shake, shake the, the hand, hand of the head, head girl. girl. Out of respect. respect. By the way, I'm not claiming to be good at British accents, okay? Puppy claps back and says, when the head girl has earned my respect, then I will shake her hand, biatch. Yeah. <laughs> Apology accepted. Harriet scoffs and her and her minions flip around, slapping Poppy in the face with the dead turkeys. <laughs> As they walk away, Harriet's ranting to her minions, saying, stunningly hideous ego, which desperately seeks a good bashing. And should we oblige? We think so. We, we think, think so, so too. So, <laughs> I freaking love them. The posse, I call it. So all the students have gone in and Poppy's saying goodbye to her dad and she's obviously very mad at him. He gives her a kiss on the cheek, says he loves her and says he'll come back at the end of the semester. And then Poppy watches her dad drive away. Now, how do I feel about Poppy sending her dad to boarding school? Oh my God, correction. Poppy's dad sending Poppy to boarding school. Would be a wee bit strange if Poppy sent her middle-aged father to boarding school, wouldn't it? <laughs> I feel like you kind of have to 
understand why he did it at the end of the movie. But right now, it seems quite extreme. Although, for me, this has been something that's happened in my family. I've had one of my siblings been shipped off to another country for behavioral stuff. I've been threatened to be sent to boarding schools. So I feel like if you have strict parents or if you're a kid that acted out a lot, maybe this isn't something that's so crazy to you. But it is quite an extreme measure. So I would have loved to have seen more of a montage in the beginning of the film of Poppy's repeated actions. Like maybe showing her through the years and her bad behavior since her mother passed away to show how the dad just can't handle it. Because right now it's giving neglect. Anyway, let's get into Poppy meeting her doormate. So Poppy walks into her assigned room, shocked to see that she has four roommates. Oh, oh. <laughs> communal. She instantly grabs her hand sanitizer, starts like spritzing her area. And the girls are hiding all their chocolates. This girl, Drippy, I love her nickname, Drippy, shows her the wagon wheel and is like, oh my God, you haven't lived. Poppy, naturally, as a Y2K Malibu teen, is like, ew, that's carbs and sugar. What a revelation. I had no idea. Mm. She pulls out her phone, which the girls don't recognize because she actually has the first ever iPhone. Remember, we're still on flip phones, Nokias and Blackberries in this day. She's trying to call someone. She can't get any signal and the girls say there isn't any. And she stresses how imperative it is for her to make her phone calls. How's How she going to call her therapist? therapist? <laughs> She's joking, right? They scoff because obviously back in the day, therapists were kind of frowned upon, seen as quacks or something only used by rich people. Oh, sweetheart. This is not Beverly Hills 90210. Kate tells Puppy that they're only allowed their phones on the weekend, so she better hide it before Matron comes. And they ask where her trunk is. Puppy says it hasn't been delivered yet. Then we get a quick scene where we see that her trunk has been delivered, but during the storm. So Puppy's going through the trunk, freaking out, saying, not, not the new season, season Gucci. Gucci. Oh my God, the Jimmy Choo's. Yes. No. no. <laughs> so then we meet Matron. Welcome back, kiddos. She is kind of like the house mother, I guess. Like she takes care of the girls in the boarding school. And as soon as she walks in, Puppy's like, oh, thank God, stop. Can you please dry clean this, press this, do this? And Matron just looks over at one of the girls, Josie, and says, oh, is she? And Josie says, yes, American. Anyway, Matron's in there with the bucket collecting all the girls' phones, because remember, they're only allowed them on the weekend. When she grabs Poppy's phone, she freaks, saying, ah, uh, no, hands off, and starts speaking to her in Spanish, like kind of stereotypical Americans thinking that the help is Spanish, you know? Habla Espanol. I am Scottish. Good, then you understand. And she starts throwing her wet clothes into Matron's bucket, telling her to get it clean. Obviously, that's very rude. So to punish her, Matron says she can't wear home clothes for a week. Like, I give a shit. Hmm? I'll be gone by then. Language! And Matron's like, two Sunday detentions for everyone. She tries to bribe Matron and tells her to buy herself something nice, because honestly, anything would be an improvement. Matron scoffs, gives the whole dorm another third detention. Thanks a lot for that. You got a moron. What are you, mental? She, she was, was a grade, grade one a-hole a -hole with, with a severe, severe attitude, attitude no problem. problem. I still don't really know what that phrase means. I was eight in 2008 but the girls tell puppy to put on a uniform she doesn't want to so they all yell no! and then we get another iconic scene where we get to see puppy walking through the halls in her version of the uniform she has altered it you know fashionista stilettos instead of flats high-waisted short skirt instead of knee-length waist skirt crop blazer and tie tucked into the shirt with a chunky belt mm, she finessed that fit so kate gives puppy the 411 of the school rules which are pretty basic and tells her not to drag them down with her shit because the whole dorm gets punished if someone does something bad which i don't really understand do not get us in your shit or we will break you oh i'm scared Anyway, so they walk into the cafeteria and the students are all standing until Mrs. Kingsley, the teachers and the prefects arrive, but Poppy's already sitting and the girls tell her she has to stand up for them and, and Poppy's like, screw them. So they grab her, throw her up and she's like, oh. That is physical abuse. I'm calling my lawyer. With what? <laughs> so Mrs. Kingsley, the teachers, they all walk in along with a very handsome blonde gentleman. Poppy asks who it is and the girls tell her that's Freddie, Mrs. Kingsley's son, who is played by Alex Pettifer, who is like the love interest of this film. And Kate says, cue Harriet. So they all joke as Harriet goes over and flirts with Freddie. And Drippy gives Poppy the full one one on Freddie being the principal's son. Basically, he comes here when he's not at school and he is forbidden from fraternizing with the students. Won't look at any of us since he got caught playing doctors and nurses with a girl in the third grade when he was 11. So the food arrives to the table and Poppy says she can't eat it. Drippy nonchalantly asks her if it's anorexia or bulimia, because if it's bulimia, she'd rather she didn't eat other people's birthday cakes. It's such a waste. Which is kind of funny to me. Like, I've struggled with ED, so I can appreciate the dark humor, but damn, the stuff that was said in the Y2K movies, it's kind of sad you can't say it nowadays anymore, but also kind of good. I don't know, I'm kind of torn on that kind of humor. Anyway, Poppy then says the most nonsensical sentence ever. She says she can't eat this because she's a pescatarian Monday through Thursday. Fruit 
vegetarian Thursday through Sunday and vegetarian always, which all doesn't make sense because vegetarian means you eat no meat, which fish is part of that, and a pescatarian eats meat. Correction, a vegetarian eats no meat whatsoever, whereas a pescatarian eats fish. Therefore, a vegetarian cannot be a pescatarian because fish classifies as meat. Thank you. And a fruitarian only eats fruit. The entire thing makes no sense. Anyway, she's obviously in this weird diet culture of the Y2K era. So Mrs. Kingsley rings the bell and the girls all start saying grace, but Poppy loudly starts doing a Hindu prayer that she learned probably in yoga. Nom ring gai kai. Everyone goes really quiet and looks over at Poppy, including Freddy, who gives her a little smirk. Poppy smiles back at him, so they've made contact. He is aware. She is on his radar. This is our meet cute, but it only gets cuter from here. <laughs> Namaste. So after lunch, the girls are walking down the halls, and I really like the shot of Harriet and her minion's feet walking through the hall versus Poppy and her friends. You get the stilettos versus Harriet's sensible little heel compared to all the other students who have to wear flats. I like that detail. Anyway, Kate pulls Poppy aside so that Harriet can walk through, and she's like, watch the smear, girlfriend. 200 goats died for this, which are, is cashmere made out of goats? I don't really know. Also, 200 goats, that's a really small blazer. Anyway, so Harriet says to Poppy, oh, we meet again. How's the blind? And she tells Poppy, learn the rules when it comes to the right of way. There's a hierarchy, you see. It goes, teachers, teachers prefects, prefects, scholars, scholars dogs, dogs, vermin, Americans. Americans. Kate, Kate, see to what she falls in line. What is this place? Hogwarts? Oh, I don't know why. I just freaking love Harriet so much. Poppy, Poppy Moore, bed, no! Bed. So it's the next day or nine, and the girls are in their dorm room pampering and chilling. And Poppy's got her back face to the girl with her headphones in. She's got her UV lights on her to simulate the sunlight so she doesn't get SADD, of course. And the girls are behind her talking about her. Kate's tinting Drippy's brows. And Drippy says, apparently California girls wax their bums. And Kate asks Drippy if Poppy's done it. And Drippy says, definitely. She's definitely done the missionary. And almost certainly the Lebanese fulcrum. And Kate asks how she knows this, and Drippy's like, you can tell by the shape of her hips. So all the girls lean over to look at her hips. Puppy pulls out her headphones and turns around and is like, is there a problem? Drippy asks how many boys she shagged, which means slept with in British slang. So Puppy's happy to oblige. She says, so well, there was Brandon, Brandon a pack, Chase, Jock, Jock Tyler, Tyler, Bajillionaire. And then there was Jack. Jack. Oh, he was just all around sick. sick. Christ. And then Drippy freaks when she looks in the mirror and sees how dark Kate has tinted her brows, which nowadays is kind of like a vibe. Dark brows, light hair, but obviously back then maybe not. She sulks, saying, oh. That is butters. Better not stop me pulling at the social. Honey, eyebrows are the least of your worries. Which I just love Drippy and I love the way she talks. Matron shows up, tells them all to go to bed and lights out. So they all go to bed, but after she leaves, Poppy turns on her laptop and is like, oh, of course, no Wi-Fi. Josie tells her Wi-Fi is only permitted in the computer room. So then Poppy goes to leave and they're like, we, we are not allowed out of bed after lights out. Oh, look. Hey. They're not out. What are you doing? She's making their life hell. But Puppy goes down to the computer room where she's emailing her friend Ruby, which is kind of what she does throughout the film. We learn that it's now been two weeks since she's been there and she's losing her mind. These girls are all ugly losers who think a mani petty is some kind of Latin greeting. And as she's saying this, Puppy sees Drippy walk past the computer room. So she follows her all the way into the kitchen where Drippy goes into the freezer to sneakily eat out of a tub of ice cream, which Puppy thinks is pretty gross. But don't knock a girl down for a midnight snack. I was there last night, except my midnight snack is like a boiled egg, which I'm not sure if that's weird. It just really like fills me up before bed. Anyway, then a fire alarm goes off for a, a fire drill. We've all had to do these fire drills at schools before. Probably a bit of foreshadowing though in there. So Poppy freaks because she runs up to try to go to her room, but Matron is there collecting all the girls. So she can't get in in time. So she climbs out the window onto the roof. She's trying to figure out where to go. She sees all the students coming to the front. She climbs up a fire escape, crawls into a window, which goes into someone's bathroom. And she hears the voice of a man in a bathtub with a shower curtain around him. So she can't see him. Hey, who's there? And she says, Poppy. And he says, who? And she says, more, Poppy more. Well, more, Poppy more. And they have a bit of banter and she's like, sorry, sir, I'll be leaving now. Oh, and uh, try not to get caught. Excellent point, sir. So the next day we get our first lacrosse practice. Oh, baby, calm down. Calm down, calm down, calm down. I feel like in every teen 2000s film, there was always like a big sport. I mean, obviously most of the time it was football, but for She's the Man, we had like soccer and for Wild Child, we have lacrosse. Anyway, so the practice is kind of shite and the coach says, you know, great effort girls. We might not win the championships, but we'll sure make a lot of friends. <laughs> 
Poppy's like, oh, so bloody English. And Harry asks if Poppy could do any better and she challenges her to a little duel. So we get a little Western edit, you know, kicking the feet, close up of the eyes. They charge at each other, but they end up just fighting. And we hear a car pull up and it is Freddy in his convertible. Shouldn't you guys be in bikinis for that? Oh, hi Fredster, dig a car. <laughs> Freddy recognizes Poppy and is like, hey, more, Poppy more. And she's like, hey, oh. And she realizes who he is, but he drives off before she can say anything. Now she clicks. He's the guy from the bathtub. They've had two encounters. This is their third. And Poppy notices that Harriet's a little jelly. She's like, what's that? You got a crush on Mr. Fredster? Want to kiss him on the lips? Oh, girls, I think we've got a Sula on our hands. Sweaty, Sweaty upper, upper lip. <laughs> Which I think is so funny, because like, when you want to kiss someone, do you get a sweaty upper lip? Is that like a thing? So Harriet storms off and runs into her rooms with her minions and yells at her like 11 year old servant. You may depart. I still have to turn down your bed. Get out! It's literally a student who just like does everything for her. I don't really know what this setup is. It's a bit bizarre. And she says to her minions, how on earth did Freddy know her name? And she's looking in the mirror where she has a collage of pictures of Freddy printed out. Very creepy, but you know, we respect a girl who has a vision board. She's manifesting, okay? She's getting her chakras aligned. Freddy's got a crush on me. Her minions are really scared, looking at each other, trying to figure out what to say. And one of them says, oh, well, he was probably looking at her so he didn't come across like he was looking at you. You know, he's got to be careful. He can't get caught. And besides, if he looked at Harriet, he wouldn't be able to control himself. Like, when I have to look sad, I think about horses being slaughtered. So, to Freddy, Poppy's the equivalent of a slaughtered horse. After her minions give in to her delusions and she's full-blown into Luland, Harriet's like, oh, you're probably right, but we're going to have to do something about Little Miss USA. So then Poppy storms into Principal Kingsley's office saying, I didn't start, start it, it, it wasn't, wasn't my fault. fault, and if, if this was America, America, I would sue. sue. And Mrs. Kingsley's like, I already know what happened, that she knows it's hard being in the new girl, so she gives Puppy a book to read, Alice in Wonderland. We all love that book, classic. This is my punishment. This school is so weird. What do you want to get out of this school, Puppy? To get out of this school. So she gives her a little pep speech, you know, we see your potential, this school is whatever you make of it. We haven't had anyone that would grace the page of Us Weekly, but we have girls who graduate from here who are best friends for life. What we do produce is small. Smart, independent, free-thinking, good-hearted girls. The kind of girl that behind all your wisecracks I know you are. I feel like Mrs. Kingsley's role throughout this movie is, I mean, the whole reason her dad sent her to this boarding school in the first place was to straighten her up, like improve her behavior, get her on a better track. And I think it's kind of nice that she has sort of a mother figure, for lack of a phrase, to kind of help her, because clearly her dad doesn't know what he's doing. Anyway, so it's the next day and Harriet's in her room making sketches of designs with pictures of Kira Knightley from Pride and Prejudice, Mr. Darcy, because that's the outfit she's wearing to the school social, which is like the British version of a prom. Here in Australia, we call them a formal. Why are there different names for everything? Anyway, so she has her student, slave, staining her white dress with coffee grounds. I need complete authenticity. Charlotte heard Freddie say I looked exactly like Kira Knightley. And she looks out the window going, hmm, doing that Kira Knightley lip thing. This bitch, like, she gets me. Anyway, as she's looking out the window, she sees Poppy sitting down below on a bench, looking very sullen. So she gets her bucket, takes the white dress out of it, and gets the coffee water from her servant and tells her to toss it out the window so she doesn't spill it. She's like, are you sure about that, Harriet? She's like, just do it. The other girl's in the other window, pulls out the bucket, which goes all over Poppy, and Harriet's out the other window like, oh, I'm so sorry. You really just can't trust the hell. Do you have a pass to be out during lessons? Yeah, I do. It's it's right here! Don't walk on the grass! So the beef between these girls is really brewing. We've got a full on brisket going on here and I like it. I think Harriet is a really good antagonist for this film. She is sometimes a little more iconic than Poppy, I ain't gonna lie. Like the way this actress delivers her lines, her accents, her attitude, her commitment, Chef's kiss. Anyway, so later that day, Poppy is really sad, sitting on the window bench, soaking in her UV lights, and Kate walks in, and they sigh, roll their eyes at each other, remember they don't like each other at this point. Kate tells her, how many times have we told you you gotta make your bed? Poppy goes to do it, but because she's probably never done anything for herself, she doesn't know how to make a bed properly. So Kate helps her out with it. She's also like, oh my god, you're freezing. And Poppy's like, I didn't bring anything thicker than cashmere. I didn't think I'd be here this long. So Kate gives her a jumper, which is really sweet. And then Kate goes to her little bedside table, grabs her phone, and Poppy's like, I thought Matron took all the phones and she's like no she took our decoys which is so smart they have like fake phones that matron takes so they can still use their real ones so she offers the phone to poppy saying you know call whoever you like call your therapist poppy's like why would you help me though you think i'm an asshole kate spells it out for her saying no you behave like an asshole there is a difference i know that i'm not some malibu therapist but i can guess that you're feeling scared and a little bit homesick which doesn't actually make you a bad person, just a normal one. And after some silence, Kate notices a photo that Poppy has on her nightstand with her and her mom. She gonna come out and visit? 
She died in a car accident when I was 11. Oh. And this moment really humanizes Poppy for Kate, so she offers her some help. She asks if she's really serious about getting out of the school, because if she is, she's gonna have to do something really, really severe so she can be put in front of the honor court, which is the principal, teachers, and prefects, who will decide whether or not she'll be expelled. And Poppy is all in. So this is kind of like the mission for the second act of the film, is the girls helping Poppy get expelled from the school. If you really want to get expelled, you can't just rock the boat. You have to drive it up onto the rock, set fire to the galley, and dance on the burning deck. Aye, aye, Captain. So the next scene, which is kind of a tie back to Poppy's old world, is Kate leaves her with her phone. She does a FaceTime call high up on a shelf, which is the only space where she can get service. To Ruby, she leaves her little video, and we see that Ruby is in the hot tub with Poppy's boyfriend, Ronnie, or Roddy. I don't really know what his name is. Now she Oh, she is such a romantic Roddy. Yeah, that's something that was from the deleted extended scene is that Poppy has a boyfriend back home and her bestie Ruby's cheating on her. You're Roddy for me. You already have. Anyway, so that night Poppy's in bed with her lighter. She uses a lighter throughout the film to kind of like look at stuff. She plays with it. She's kind of like an arsonist. What's, what's it? Is it an arsonist? An arsonist is someone who commits a crime of fire. A pyromaniac. Aren't those the people who are obsessed with fire? I don't know. When I was younger once, I lit my rug on fire. But, but, but that was like, that was like just, just genuine curiosity as a kid. Actually, no, I also used to burn my fingers and... Okay, we're gonna stop sharing this. <laughs> so, as she's reading Alice in Wonderland, the friends will show up with their torches and they're talking about their plan to get Poppy out of the school. Kate has convinced them all to help her out. We're your very own crack unit. Operation Freedom, Kiki, please explain. Right. She explains over some montage footage. So first of all, we see her and Kiki setting something up in one of those classic British phone boxes and Harriet gets a phone call from someone asking what she's wearing and if she's been naughty. No, I have certainly not been naughty. And her disciplinary record, record is exemplary. exemplary. We see a man hang up in the phone booth and we see some pictures where it's a Photoshop picture of Harriet in her uniform and some lingerie with the title saying, little naughty schoolgirl Harriet and the phrase satisfaction guaranteed, eager to please. So that's the first prank, which I think is kind of mean and creepy, but ultimately they play it in a fun hearted way. The next prank is kind of dumb, but you know, vibes, I guess. They put like dye in the swimming pool with shaving cream and kind of make it look like a oval kind of eye, which disrupts the gym teacher's class. Then we then have a third prank, which is where they swapped over the disc for the French teacher to a disc of French speaking, explaining how the ginger French teacher was seen making out with the ginger gym teacher. Puppy. Puppy. <laughs> I just love the way people say her name. I mean, her name's kind of iconic in general. Fun fact, I actually almost named my cat Poppy over this character, but no, her name's Penelope now, Nailby for short. Anyway, so Kiki's voiceover goes on where she says, Headmaster Kingsley will eventually have to call Poppy's father. And we see Headmaster Kingsley talking to the teachers where the ginger French teacher is trying to comfort the sports teacher who's crying and he accidentally touches her breast. Kiki then says, with any luck, she'll have to put Poppy before the honor court. And I really like the way the scene's done, like camera pans from Mrs. Kingsley's office and then it pans up to Harriet's room. So she's in her horse riding gear. Of course, she's a horse girl. She slaps her whip. Harriet says, it's bloody unbelievable. Puppy's got more lives than a Buddhist cat. And Kingsley hasn't even mentioned on his court. Minion One says, people are starting to like Puppy now. To which Harriet remarks, people can learn to get used to rotting pig's vomit if they live with it for long enough. Harriet says, five generations of her family have made the school great. And the school motto is scholarship, fellowship, loyalty. Not, Not to be, be a, a slutty, slutty, whoring, whoring shit brain. <laughs> I love how they're able to like use this messed up language in like a teen movie, but of course we can never say the F word. It also just speaks to the kind of insults that girls would throw at each other when there's literally no proof of her being a slut or a whore, which in any case, what is a slut and a whore? It's kind of subjective in that. This is gonna be one of my most painful videos, I swear. All these British accents. So the minions praise Harriet and the camera pans down past Mrs. Kingsley's office where now the ginger French teacher is crying and the sports teacher's comforting him. The camera continues to pan down as we see Kate and Poppy run past and they go to a car, which is Matron's car. They jam a tape into her music tape thingy. I don't know, I've never been in a car that took tape. So they jam it in and they break the volume button, but then they hear footsteps coming, so they crawl under the car, and then Freddy shows up in his convertible. Matron comes out telling Freddy that he's distracting her class, and we see all these girls pressed against the window trying to get a glimpse of Freddy, which honestly, I understand. I went to an all-boys private school for a couple of years back when I was in South Africa. When you go to like an all-boy or an all-girls school, the horniness desperation factor is a lot higher because you're deprived of the opposite gender. So I can understand understand that. And also, Freddy or Alex Pettifier was a crush of mine back in the day. He looks like someone I had a crush on at one point. Just that Greek goddess face. Mm. Have you seen him in I Am Number 4? 
Chef's kiss. Anyway, so as Freddy's talking to Matron, he drops his keys, and when he picks them up, he sees Kate and Poppy under the car. They tell him to keep quiet, and when he gets up and still talking to Matron, she's about to leave. When Kate sneezes, he pretends it's him. <laughs> Sorry, terrible allergies. And then Poppy goes with a joke, does a fart noise, and he's like, Better an empty house than an angry tenant, right? <laughs> Which, I mean, in this economy, this living rental accommodation crisis, it's a little insensitive. Considering it was 2008, I'll digress, but even back then, wasn't that the global economic... What the frick was it called? We like the market crashed or something? I don't know, I was eight. How many times do I have to say that? <laughs> the next scene is the girls in like a communal bathtub situation. Not really sure how this works, bit of an interesting, bizarre situation, but, and they're chatting about how Mrs. Kingsley is really letting Poppy get off easy. So they're gonna have to up the ante and focus on Mrs. Kingsley's big weakness, Freddie. <laughs> Mrs. Kingsley will go ballistic and Harriet would have an absolute fit. <laughs> well, that's a definite bonus. <laughs> Freddie will be at the social, of course, and Poppy needs to get caught snogging him, which just means making out. So the next day, they're gonna have to go into town and get some killer outfits for the Saturday school dance, because they're gonna have, like, boys come over from a neighboring school, and Drippy wants to get something elegant, yet slutty and available. In fact, I'm not that bothered about elegant. <laughs> They all laugh and have a bubble bath fight, and it's cute because honestly, girls just want to have fun and it's what they deserve. Okay, I wanted nothing more when I was eight to be a teenage girl. Anyway, so in the computer room the next day, Poppy's finishing up another email to Ruby, updating her on her plan to get expelled. Poppy, we're gonna miss the bus. Don't forget to log off now, you ninny. Foreshadowing. And as she comes out, Matron is not loving her fit. Even though she just like has her shoulders showing, there's like no cleavage or anything, but you know, God forbid a girl show her shoulders, right? So then Harriet shows up saying, I thought this would happen. We took the liberty of going to Lost and Found we brought you this. It'll suit you. Promise. But honestly, today I could see this eating up on TikTok. It's giving. I feel like ugly sweaters are a vibe. So then the bus arrives and the girls hop on, but Poppy's trying to find her hand sanitizer because she doesn't want to grab this pole that they're all touching. She's a germaphobe. We've been new. But the bus leaves without her and the girls are all screaming at her and she's like, I can't put my They're kikiing, having fun, which is funny because one of their names is Kiki. And as they're on the bus, they hear this loud music coming past, and it's Matron in her convertible, and she's trying to change the music, but it won't change. <laughs> So now they've successfully pranked Matron, the gym teacher, the French teacher, and Harriet. So now, next step, Mrs. Kingsley, the final ball. Although I wouldn't say hooking up with her son is much of a prank now, would I? But, you know, it's a wee bit of fun in there. Okay, this British accent is gonna be the death of me. So the girls have got off the bus, we're in town, and Poppy's walking in her heels on cobblestones. High heels on cobblestones, vintage tea, Brand new phone. Cardigan, Taylor Swift, Folklore, Stream It. Anyway, so they go into a thrift store and Poppy's not feeling it. Something like this. 50 pence. Looks like someone died in it. So Kate's like, you're a Buddhist. Why don't you just think of it as fashion reincarnation? Honey, even Buddha wouldn't be caught dead in half this stuff. I have to ask, didn't Buddha just wear robes? Guess anything's possible. Few montage. One thing about 2000s maybe it's gonna give you a montage and you know it. So the girls are dancing, throwing clothes around, trying on, playing dress up, and Poppy starts ripping up clothes, making new clothes, you know, like how she did with her uniform. She's a fashionista, we've been new, come through. And says that if they just called this stuff vintage and add just three extra zeros to the price, she could really get into it. Poppy then calls for a Malibu moment and it's like, girls, remember this? So we don't remember this because this was in that opening sequence that was cut, but anyway. <gasps> Which I still do this to this day with some of my friends. Just to remind yourself that like you are always have been that bitch, you know. I, if I'm just gonna infer that that is what it means, then that is what it means because I feel like me and Poppy are kind of on the same wavelength. I don't know. So then the girls go to a salon to freshen up. The hairstylist is hilarious. I don't know why this guy reminds me of the guy from Frozen, the Disney movie. Hey, mommy, two strong teeth, please bella pronto. Big summer blowout. Woohoo! Big summer blowout. Like a hilarious accent. I don't even know what it is. And he's reading Drippy for Filth for her busted brows. Oh my god, it's Tom Cruise. He goes over to Poppy and rips out a strand of her hair and starts sniffing it. Mmm. Okay, very eccentric. And she says she wants these extensions removed and replaced, some deep conditioning, side bangs. Which, by the way, side bangs are having a comeback. Comment down below your thoughts on that, because I I keep trying to do side bangs and it just isn't working. I feel like side bangs don't work when you have thick hair, but anyway, let's move on. 
I seriously need a new chair. Buttery highlights and uh, maybe a few honey tones. Ooh, and I'd like a night on Fireman Island, but I'm afraid I'm whistling Dixie, okay? Well, I want a summer in Barbados, but we can't all get what we want now, can we? And he offers her some options. He's like, what about a tight perm? Mm -mm. A bob? No. Even though bobs are really in right now. The bob? You know what I call a bang with a bob? A biob. A bang. A bang a bob. She's not interested in any of his suggestions, so he's like, what about something a bit more natural? Aye, the real you. Natural it is. You're telling me a girl who cares this much about her appearance is just gonna just let this random hairdresser in this random salon do whatever he wants to her hair? Girl, you've got a lot of trust. So he starts grabbing a bunch of tools, he's wiping his sweat, he's getting a drink from Trudy, and we get the reveal. Basically, he took out the extensions, dyed Puppy's hair brown, which we're supposed to assume is her natural hair color, and gave her a side sort of a side part. It's cute, it's fresh, um, and it suits her because that was Anna Roberts' natural hair at the time. She was actually wearing a wig for the blonde portion of the film. So the girls are like, oh my God, you look so English. And she's like, I look like my mom. Is she beautiful too? She was. You know, we gotta remind ourselves why she's here in the first place. The girl's struggling about her mom, which I'm not gonna make any jokes about because that's some real ish. And this scene, this haircut, you know, we all know, well, I'm assuming we all know how much of a big deal it is for a girl to change her hair. You know, whether you're dyeing it, cutting it, whatever it is, like having a big hair change symbolizes a big life change. And this is kind of Poppy's change from that rich, spoiled, rude Malibu girl to kind of assimilating into the Abby Mount girl, making friends. This is a turning point. Guys. I think this is a turning point. I feel like this is a turning point. Totally. So next up on the list while they're out in the town is the girls are trying to score some liquor, which they call juice. It's giving the Sims. But it's approving, no. Um, but Kate has a plan. So she goes into the bottle store with Drippy and they start talking like their moms. I don't know what's worse, my job or that husband of mine. Mm. What's the report about? Oh. Um, business. What? So then Kate tries to sophisticately order her booze. Two bottles of Krasinski and one of Don Matza, please. Mattel is about to do it, but then Drippy wants to get two cream eggs. And she blows it, they're outside. Kate is going in on her like you just had to get the cream eggs. Why did you only get two, Drippy? Now I've got a quarter then? And then Poppy comes out and she's like, don't worry guys. And she got the booze. So they're like, yeah, let's go have fun. So it's the night of the school social. It's the night of the dance. The French teacher and the dim teacher are flirting with each other. I thought you might like a fruit punch. Oh, I'll, I'll have it shaken and not stirred. They're so awkward. I love them, honestly. Very funny. So we hear classical music and Harriet walks in because it's a costume party that I mentioned and her best Keira Knightley look from Pride and Prejudice and she's walking like this with her lips. <laughs> so she goes over to Freddie who gives her a very lukewarm response, which by the way, I hate that phrase. Mr. Darcy, what undue pleasure it is to be afforded your company. Hi. She's like, Freddie, it's me, Harriet. And he's like, Yes, Harriet, I know. <laughs> on the other side of the villa, though, Poppy and her friends show up on the staircase, which I just love a girl group descending on a staircase in their slight outfits at a dance. Anyway, so their outfits are fire. Poppy handmade all of these from the outfits of the thrift store. She's really a thrift flipper before that was even really a thing. And I commend her for that because she's wearing a horse print, like little horses on a dress, and she somehow makes it fierce. She tells the girls, and honestly, they're just serving legs on long, heels on high, hair on fierce, lips on gloss. Like they're giving what they need to give. And this scene is just like perfection to me. If you really strip away the vibes, like they look kind of, they look kind of strange. The outfits are kind of a mess, but like the way they serve it with their confidence, it just does something to me. It just really does. I love a good entrance. And honestly, the second the girls get there, the whole vibe of the social changes. Now it's a party. Cause let's not forget these girls, they've been, they've been drinking. drinking. So Poppy goes over to Freddie and he says, Hi. Hello Trouble, I like your hair. And Harriet's outraged because this is a themed party. Not a dwarf prostitutes convention. <laughs> I'm not laughing at the dwarf part. I have nothing against little people, but like just the way she comes up with these insults, dwarfs prostitute convention. It's the creativity for me. Poppy sarcastically apologizes and tells Harriet she makes an excellent Shrek. <laughs> Which honestly, Poppy, you serve the conviction, but the insults aren't there. And then Nelly Furtado's Say It Right song starts playing. <laughs> Something about this song that just like straight up does something to me. Okay, 
Okay, I know that was probably like the widest dance you've ever seen, but you try dancing in the chair, it's not easy. Anyway, Poppy says it's her favorite song, Taste, grabs Freddie to go dance with her. They're dancing on the dance floor, it's really cute. Harry gets jealous, goes over to the DJ and changes the music to like some like rap club music, which she probably thinks Poppy's not gonna dance to. But what we missed from the opening sequence that was cut, which still pisses me off, is that Poppy knows how to crunk. Does she know how to crunk well? I don't know because I'm not sure if I ever have crunked. But the girl crunks. She crunks to the music. And she's like serving. Everybody is like surrounding her in a circle. They're dancing in a gazebo. And Harriet realizes that her plans failed. And Poppy is giving what she needs to be giving. And then there's something about this dance. I'm not sure if it's in slow mo or if the, because the camera's not showing her feed. But like I know that it's probably really awkward in 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 theory. But the way that she shows it, it's just like the serve of the fucking century. <laughs> Like, I remember watching this and just thinking, like, that's dance. That's how you dance. Which is probably why I suck at dancing to this day. <laughs> anyway, so enough about that. When Puppy goes to leave the gazebo, she trips and falls. Puppy's laying on the ground. Everybody's, like, hovering over her. And Harriet's like, she's clearly drunk. She needs to go to bed. And Puppy's like, Freddie could do the honors. A bit naughty for a teen flick. Freddie says that he'll take Puppy for some air. So Harriet tells her minions to spy on them and report back to her. So Puppy and Freddie go somewhere private, secluded, where they're sitting in one of those, like, two-way chairs when you're on either side. I've always wanted to have one of those chairs or like sit on one of them before because of this movie. I just think it's so iconic. So he asks her to explain herself to him and she quotes Alice in Wonderland. Remember Mrs. Kingsley gave her that book. And he really resonates with this because he actually played Alice in Alice in Wonderland's production of his school. And he's like, hey, I went to an all boys school. There weren't that many options. Then Poppy like awkwardly out of the blue just throws herself at Freddy. Hey. <laughs> you so don't need to play hard to get. I'm totally into you. Hey, <laughs> come on. Oh no. Which, she doesn't even seem embarrassed at all. Timmy, are you not embarrassed? It's embarrassing. Cards on the table. Are you gay? <laughs> uh, just English. I'm not sure what that's me, but what that means, like, do people just assume British men are gay? Anyway, he says, I'm sober and sensible and you're drunk and concussed. And he says he's gonna go back to school the next day, but he'll be back in 18 days and he can see her then, but only if she promises not to fry his head. Since it might be your forte. I won't fry your head if you don't poach my heart. Oh, I love an egg pun. I love eggs. That's cute. I'm not sure if that's an egg pun or a reference to something, but I'm gonna go with an egg pun because that makes it funnier. Just a really cute scene. He seals the deal and leans in for a kiss, but of course, they're interrupted by Harriet's minions who remind Freddy that fraternizing with the girls is forbidden. So him and Poppy leave and the girls agree not to tell Harriet because they think she'll shoot the messenger. So Poppy heads back into the socials just as Kate finishes snogging a guy and gets off his lap. Bit risque. She asks if Operation Freddy is a go and she says, well, Harriet didn't show up. So it depends if the minions tell her. Then they see the minions talking to Harriet and Harriet looks happy. So they're like, oh, we're gonna have to figure something else out. Still didn't get caught. Puppy then asks the girls, isn't it ironic that her ticket out of here just might be the reason she wants to stay? Mm, so she's falling for Freddy. I mean, who wouldn't? <laughs> then DJ Frenchie plays the final, Frenchie, why did I write that? DJ French teacher plays the final song and the girls run to the floor and Puppy says she has to tell the girls something. Drippy says, we already know, you wax your bum. <laughs> Drippy then gathers that she hasn't done it, and Poppy says she couldn't admit it back home, so she lied, but she's a total nun. Welcome to the nunnery! <laughs> I love angels instead. <laughs> Which, being a virgin at 16, I feel like that's pretty normal, but I do think it's kind of funny how, like, they call it the nunnery. <laughs> so silly. But anyway, before we get into the next couple scenes in the third act of the film, I think I'm gonna change my look, because Poppy's changed her look, and she's also changing as a character, so I feel like it's only fitting, so... Alrighty guys, I am back. My new look is giving uh, 12th grade, stressed student, sweaty, uh, you know, just ruffled tie, messy bun. Yes. So it's the next morning after the social. Mrs. Kingsley is giving a stern talking to, to Kate, Drippy, and Poppy. They got so drunk and Drippy was laying in her own vomit. Drippy corrects her saying, no, it was actually Kate's vomit. I just happened to be laying in it, which is just disgusting. She lets the two of them go and then talks to Poppy and is like, look, I don't know whether I should be glad that you've made friends or furious that you've led them astray. Please, Poppy, like, I'm trying to help you. Just like, try. Try. Maybe there's something you, you'll be good at. Judging by those outfits that you made last night, 
mind. If you put your mind to something, you can really do it. So after Mrs. Kingsley's pep talk, Puppy has a little fire under her ass because in their next lacrosse match where Puppy usually just sits on the bench, Drippy can't play and she is like throwing up. So she asked Puppy to take over and Harriet's like, oh, it's okay, we'll do fine without another player. And Puppy's like, okay, well, just because you said that, I'm going to play. And Puppy really kind of whips the team back into shape. She kind of is like giving them a motivational pep talk. So then we see at the next school assembly that Mrs. Kingsley is congratulating the lacrosse team for winning their first match and making it to the next round of the county championships for the first time since 1976. She also mentions that if anyone would like to sign up to practice, they better talk to the team captain. And then she's about to say Harriet, but then she's like, oh no, okay, Poppy Moore. So now the beef's beefing, the, the brisket's burning at this point because now Poppy has taken Harriet's team captain role on the lacrosse team. Okay, so then we get a bunch of different montages of Poppy whipping her team into shape. She says she wants to give them an aggression makeover. And you really get to see her channeling a lot of her energy into the sport of lacrosse. And this is where I feel like her character starts to change quite a bit because she's so focused on building her team up and uh, this activity that she's no longer focusing on trying to get out of the school anymore. However, on a new day, Poppy is leaving another email to her Malibu bestie, Ruby. And then Drippy comes over to the computer room and grabs grabs Poppy because Freddie is waiting for her. They crunk and she goes for her date. However, remember the foreshadowing, Poppy forgot to log out of her email and we see a creepy little scene of someone clicking on the computer and tip tip typing away on Poppy's emails. Ooh, that'll, Ooh, come, that'll come, back come back soon. So outside Poppy meets Freddie and they have some banter. He wants to get out in his car, but Poppy just wants to walk around the school grounds because remember she wants to get caught and he's like, uh, no way, let's get in the cars. So when they reach the little town, which is sort of like a bayside cottage core, the Cotswold sort of vibe, I mean a montage of them frolicking King, chatting on the beach under a blanket. Very adorable. I love it a lot. Um, then they sit in a classic British pub and he shows Poppy a British delicacy. He, he gives her a piece of white bread, puts some like soft chips or fries, whatever you want to call them. They look pretty like swishy and he puts it in there and just closes it. No sauce, no nothing. He calls it a chip butty. The humble chip butty. Then Poppy starts to say how this is the best date she's ever been on, but Freddie interrupts her by kissing her, and it's so adorable. And after that, he says something to her that's a little cheesy, but really cute in the moment. Something about you, Poppy. Every moment I'm with you, I catch my breath. Because, you know, the classic, I let out a breath I didn't know I was holding thing. It's a very popular line if you read, like, YA. I'm giggling and kicking my feet because another montage, they're like driving back home. Adele's Chasing Pavements has been playing throughout this entire montage. So a very cute date, but then it's ruined because Puppy gets back to her dorm to see that all the girls are huddled around in the bed looking really mad. And they start reading out a nasty email that Poppy had sent to Ruby where she talks shit about them and how she's just using them. But it's very embellished and Poppy says that she didn't write any of that except for the loser part, which was weeks ago. The girls say it was dated today from her email address and taped to the door. You're seriously a hideous cow. Come on, guys. You have to believe me. Then Kate says that all they were trying to do was make her life happier, which, I mean, I don't really know because, like, it's not like you were trying to make her enjoy her time at the school so she would stay. You were trying to help her get expelled. I'm not sure if, like, the message got lost in translation, but anyway. Freddie gets an insulting, embellished email from Puppy as well, and she goes to talk to him saying she can explain, but he just slams the door in her face. So she's really down bad. That night, Puppy's laying in bed, playing with her lighter. She then goes to the kitchen, and then she calls her friend Ruby, really wanting to talk to her, but Ruby's having a fashion emergency, so she can't talk right now. And she gets off the phone trying to talk to Roddy or Ronnie, which is Poppy's boyfriend who now, I guess maybe she forgot about because now she's with Freddie. Okay, seize yourself. Come on, Roddy hasn't seen you in like a week. Oh, okay. I don't know, they're just all cheating on each other. Sorry, Roddy. Can get rid of her. Roddy, babe. No, Ruby. Still me. Babe. And she hangs up. So that's that friendship finally squashed. And Poppy is just really struggling. She kind of dissociates or like, or gives into her intrusive thoughts. Cause as she's playing with the lighter, she lights the curtain on fire. She tries to put it out and it looks like she did, but then she hears footsteps coming. So she quickly runs up back to her room. However, downstairs, Drippy opens the freezer because she was in there eating her late night ice cream snack, which Poppy didn't realize she was in there. And she sees that there is a huge fire in the kitchen. So she screams, goes back and the freezer door locks her in. Ooh, this is where it gets intense. So upstairs, Poppy wakes up when she hears a noise, looks out the window to see that the kitchen is on fire. She wakes up Kate saying, I tried to put it out. I swear I didn't mean to. And Kate's like, Jesus, Poppy, are you trying to kill us all? She's like, help me wake everyone up. So they're waking up all the students. Fire alarm goes off. Poppy's, you know, trying to save everyone. And they all get outside and Principal Kingsley, which by the way, she wakes up Freddie. She is holding her cat and she's like, there's a fire. We gotta go. I just love how she grabbed her cat first, like priorities. <laughs> I'm kidding. Anyway, while Mrs. Kingsley's doing the call out for the names, she realized 
realizes that Drippy, whose real name is Jennifer, not sure where the connection is, is missing. That's when Puppy realizes, Drippy's in the freezer! <laughs> So she starts running to go into the fire. The firefighters are trying to stop her and nobody does. You're telling me none of these like men can stop this like five foot 16 year old girl? I digress. So she gets in there and she saves Drippy from the fire. Everybody's waiting in anticipation outside. They come out, Puppy gives a cute little <laughs> cough and Drippy's fine. None of them even have soot on them. It's a bit unrealistic, but I digress. And then after they all kind of go away, you know, Freddy goes inside the fire and is like asking the firefighters how it was started. They don't know, but he steps on a I Heart LA lighter. Whose could that be? I don't know, maybe the only American in the school. So as Poppy's walking through the halls of the dorms, all the girls are praising her like, you're a hero, you saved her, thank you. She looks really guilty, but she's like being polite. But then Freddy pulls her into a corner, shows her the lighter and says, you know, you could have killed us all. And she swears she didn't mean to. She thought she put it out, but she heard footsteps. She was just upset about everything, but she regrets it. I think she was upset about everything and mad and didn't realize what she was doing. That's what I mean about the intrusive thoughts giving into it. And you know, you got to be careful with intrusive thoughts. Sometimes, Sometimes I think about I think driving, driving my car off a bridge, bridge, but do, but I? do I? No, no, no. <laughs> so then it's the next day and Mrs. Kingsley is holding an emergency assembly saying that whoever started the fire has till the end of the day to come forward before they have to press legal charges. After the assembly, Poppy sits down all in her lonesome outside and she writes an apology letter to Freddy saying that she promises him that she didn't write that email. Sneeze. <laughs> Anyway, back to Poppy's letter to Freddy. She tells him that for a moment there, he was her ticket out of here, but then she got to know him and she's never felt this way about anyone before. The letter continues as a voiceover as she's going over to Mrs. Kingsley's office where she gives her the lighter and confesses to lighting the fire and how she tried to put it out. She didn't mean to do this. Mrs. Kingsley is like obviously very disappointed and she says that the honor court will have to decide if Poppy gets expelled, but hopefully she understands it's just a formality at this point. Like you can't really light your school on fire and expect to not get expelled, you know? <laughs> I really did try to turn it around. I didn't want to disappoint you. And I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry too. Anyway, so Poppy gives Mrs. Kingsley a letter and asks her to give it to Freddie. So as Poppy walks out of her office, she bumps into Kate and Poppy is telling her the news, updating her. And Kate's like, congrats, she finally got what you wanted. And Poppy says she couldn't be more unhappy. And she tries to give Kate a gift, but Kate's like, oh, just save it. And she walks away, Poppy unrolls it. And it's like this little scrapbook decoupage picture of her and her friends from when they went thrift shopping. Oh, that seems like forever ago the good times. Mm. But as Poppy looks up from this picture, she sees on the wall, it's a picture of a lacrosse team from 1976, which is actually the year my mom was born. So shout out to you, Emma. <laughs> um, and it is a picture of her mom as the captain of the lacrosse team. And I swear it's just a picture of Emma Roberts, like kind of made blurry. It looks exactly like her. I kind of hate when they do that in movies. Anyway, so then Puppy is sitting in that two-way chair, another callback to when she was sitting in it with Freddy after the party, I'm getting stabbed in the heart, and Freddy comes up to her saying that he got her letter, and he's like, you know, you backed out of our deal. Are you going to find my head? But you poached my heart. Hey. He comforts her, so whatever she said in her letter obviously kind of struck a chord with him and he believes her. And he tells Poppy that the honor court could decide either way, but she's like, I don't know, I've really fell down the rabbit hole. Now the callback, Alice in Wonderland, she then shows him the picture of her mom saying that she didn't even know she went to the school, but you know, it's time for her to face the music. So then Kate gets back to the dorm room, finding the girls arguing, and she says that Poppy's confessed and she's going to honor court right now. Josie says that it's brave, Drippy says it's stupid, and Kiki says because she's discovered something. Mrs. Kiki always, always investigating, love that. So we run through her explaining while Harriet is over in the honor court being a tyrant, pretending that she's a lawyer. We call the honor court session. It will henceforth be our job to objectively, dispassionately ascertain what happened that fateful night? To understand the dark forces that drove a seemingly- Harriet. So Kiki says that the email was sent at 11.40 in the morning, but according to Drippy, Poppy left before then. I got my 11 o'clock wagon wheel, then I went to tell her that Freddie was waiting. <laughs> Another callback, heard her wagon wheels. Kiki says that she then gained access to the keystroke file and guess who was the only other person who had logged on around that time in the computer room? Can you, can you guys take a guess? Drippy says it's also weird that in the email Poppy said term. She calls it a bloody samosa or something. Semester. Whatever. She also says she took a sneaky look at Poppy's diary, which obviously is a bit invasive, but she finds her Friday entry, which was the day of the email, where she's written that she loves these girls. They're like the proper friends that she's never had. And she likes that she's now one of them. Apart from some atrocious spelling mistakes, it's all a bit more kosher, don't you think? So the girls realize that Poppy is going to get falsely thrown out of school. So they run over to the honor court. And when Poppy sees her friends walk in, she feels a lot better. And she stands up in front of Mrs. Kingsley, the prefix, the teachers, all the students. She apologizes for messing up and says that she's grateful for them all. I tried really hard to get out of this school. 
and only now do I realize just how much I want to stay. She learned so much from them all and felt closer to her mom now, realizing she went to school here. And it's really sad. She says that she's had a hole in her heart the past five years, but being here, it feels like it's finally starting to heal. Oh my god, I feel like I'm getting my eye my eyes are welling up. Oh, that's just so sad. You know, I lost a parent really young and I I understand what it's like trying to find ways to connect with them and the way that you act out because of not having them and just I really resonate with this aspect of Puppy's character. Oh, Woo. On a cringy note, she finishes off by saying she knows that she came here as a California girl, but now she realizes she's an Abbey Mount girl. <laughs> Harriet then objects. Objection! Sustained. And starts questioning Poppy. In your own words, where were you? Mrs. Kingsley calls her out for her nonsense. Honestly, Harriet, who else's words do you expect her to use? Just leave this to me. Sustained. While this is happening, Poppy's friends are all whispering to each other, and then their friends are whispering to the students. It's all spreading around like Chinese whispers. And when Mrs. Kingsley asks Poppy if she intended to start the fire, she says no. And Mrs. Kingsley asks if anyone was with her. Poppy says not as far as she knows, but then Kate and her friends and all the students start standing up. I was. 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 I be quiet, Harriet. But Harriet goes on saying that Poppy has to be expelled. The girl endangered them all, walked in there, light her at the ready, and tried to burn the place down. Her minions question what lighter Harriet's speaking of. And Harriet's like her ridiculous I Heart LA lighter that she's always flanging around. And one of her minions says that no one's mentioned a lighter before. Harriet then starts to stumble over her words, realizing she's done messed up. Yes, they have. Objection. Mrs. Kingsley asks how Harriet knows about the lighter. Once again, Harriet's tongue-tied, look around Harriet on mute, and Poppy then says that Freddie found the lighter before anyone else could, so how could Harriet know about that? Unless she was there. She heard footsteps when she put the fire out, and then she realizes, Oh my god, you restarted the fire, didn't you? Harriet, is this true? Of course not. It all makes sense now. I knew it. I think I'm innocent. We, we think, think so too. too. All the students get in an uproar, everyone's freaking out. Harriet just full-blown loses it. You're not! Awful bitch! You've turned this school upside down! You've ruined everything! And says that Poppy started the fire. She only finished what she started. Then she realizes she just fully admitted to the crime and Mrs. Kingsley sends Harriet to her office and the girls all run up to Poppy and give her a huge group hug. Oh! Uh. <laughs> this court scene was a lot. Seeing it all kind of come to fruition, like just seeing Harriet crack under the pressure. It was triumphant. It was amazing. So anyway, our final sort of main scene for the film. Some time has passed and it's the county's lacrosse championship finals. Poppy is leading the Abbey Mount team and her dad shows up and sits with Mrs. Kingsley. He has a moment when he looks at Poppy in the crowd and realizes that she looks like her mother. She's the spitting image of her mother, isn't she? She most certainly is. So I'm assuming maybe Mrs. Kingsley went to school with Poppy's mom or something like that. But anyway, Poppy doesn't realize her dad is there. The team is losing. So they do a little huddle and then they start doing this war cry dance, which I'm not even going to get into because it's actually heavily cringy, even by my standards. <laughs> But after all, the Abbey Mount team ends up winning at the hands of Drippy, who gets the final goal in a very clumsy, classical Drippy way. <laughs> we also get to see Harriet's ex, you know, 11-year-old servant, celebrating as she's doing the scoreboard. <laughs> So she's finally free. I'm so happy. I felt really bad for that girl. I'm not sure how that was legal or ethical. <laughs> As Poppy's celebrating with her teammates, her dad then shows up to her and she's like, oh my God, it's my dad. It's my dad. And she hugs him and it's actually really sweet. Like I'm getting... My dad! My dad! What are you doing? And Poppy's dad said that Mrs. Kingsley called saying how she found out about her mom going there. And Poppy asked why she didn't tell him. And she's like, oh, I didn't want to upset you, honey. You know, I just knew that you needed some new air to breathe. And was I right? And she says that he was. So after all, it all really worked out for the better. I mean, her mom was the captain of the lacrosse team and thrived at the school, made lifelong friends. Mrs. Kingsley, I think being one of them, it's very heavily implied. And now Poppy did the same thing. And I'm just like, they hug. And that's so wholesome. And that's like the, like kind of the end of the film. We, oh, we do have a couple of fun little scenes sprinkled throughout the credits, which is in a scrapbook sort of style. We see the next day that Harriet's dad is loading up the car with all of her stuff because she got expelled, remember? And up above, her two minions are like, Harriet, we think you forgot something. And they have the turkeys, the dead turkeys, all the way from the beginning of the movie, unless they're new ones, because I think they'd be rotting by now. And they drop it on Harriet. So they're getting their revenge. After that, the song Wild Child by Sarah Harding starts playing, I'm a real wild child.
We get some more scenes. We get Matron. We get the two Jinja teachers coming out of bed together. So they clearly hooked up. Ooh, happy for them. And then we get Poppy and her friends and Freddy over at her Malibu house. They're chilling on pool floaties. Oh, it's so cute. They came to visit her. I'm going to take my shit all over again. Right. Phone starts ringing. Freddy's like, who's Ruby? And she's like, no one, just some Aridius cow I used to know. So now she's picking up the lingo. Then Poppy and her besties hold hands and are like, you guys ready? And they jump off the edge of the infinity pool cliff into the ocean. And that's the end of that movie. Ooh. Oh my god, you guys. That was just so fun. I really hope you enjoyed this video because I thoroughly did. If you did, give it a thumbs up. Please comment down below your thoughts. Let me know if you want me to do more of these like Y2K rom-com videos because, you know, I have tried doing other series in the past, like my uh, my music series that I did for a little bit of music history and it kind of tanked. So I only kind of keep up a series if you guys enjoy it and it gets good reception. So, you know, share it with a friend if you want. I think I've said everything I have wanted to say, but I really, really enjoy how a lot of the main focus on the film is on friendship between girls, like female Male friendships. The romance is kind of more of a subplot. I feel like the main plot of the film is not only Poppy's self-development, but also the friendship that she shares with Kate, Drippy, Kiki, and Josie. And it's adorable. And also Harriet is like one of the best, most like, I don't know, she's like the best high school mean girl in a movie I've ever watched. Like she's just so iconic to me. Like, and Freddie was, you know, pretty cute actually. I think I think he did the, the role well. Mrs. Kingsley was really great for all those emotional moments and all the teachers, like this movie's just perfect to me. If I was to give it a rating out of 10, it would be a 9.5 out of 10 because I do wish that they kept the extended scene. We got a bit more of a background of Puppy's bad behavior of what led to her father sending her to boarding school, but it all worked out in the end. Anyways, guys, that's it for me in this video. I really hope you enjoyed it. And if you wanna see more of my content before my next YouTube video comes out, you can check out my Patreon link down below. I've got three different tiers there that you can choose from and shout out to my patrons for your support. Yeah, guys, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I really hope to see my next one. Subscribe, turn on that bell. And as always, I hope that you have a great day or night wherever you are in the world. Bye. Who are we? Cause I know how I feel about you now.